Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Eddie Trustovich here, the founder of the BH Futures Foundation. And I'm speaking to you live from Central Florida. And on the other side, we have Dejan Milojic, uh, the distinguished engineer from Hewlett Packard, who is going to be our first inaugural speaker in the Futures Foundation webinar series. So it is a huge honor to have Dejan as our first speaker. And it's absolutely brilliant to see so many of you live on the webinar chat. You can see you typing your names. Please use the chat to post any questions you may have during the presentation and any other comments that you would like for me to pay attention to and uh, pass them on to Dejan as he speaks to you. So let me say a few words about Dejan. So Dejan is a catalyst of change, a technical leader in system software. He's a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard Labs in Palo Alto, leading system software teams over four continents and projects with budgets of hundreds of US millions of dollars. He worked at OSF Research Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and at the Mihailo Pupin Institute in Belgrade, Serbia. Milojic received his PhD from Kaiserslautern University in Germany and his master's and bachelor degree from Belgrade University in Serbia. He was a technical director of the Open Cyrus Cloud Computing Testbed with academic, industrial and government sites in the US, Europe and Asia. He has published two books and 180 papers, probably more since this. He has 35 granted patents to support his research. He's an IEEE fellow and an ACM distinguished engineer. Milojic was on eight PhD thesis committees and taught cloud management courses at San Jose State University. As president of IEEE Computer Society in 2014, he started Technology Predictions, the top viewed CS News. As the industry engagement chair, he started the IEEE Infrastructure 2018 conference and in 2018, the IEEE Board of Directors nominated Dan for president. And as such, he is the 2020 president-elect candidate alongside Kathy Land. We all welcome Dan Milojic to the Beha Futures Foundation. Dan, I pass it over to you. Um, thank you, Eddie. Uh, it is both my honor and pleasure to speak in front of um, the people of, of my own origin. Um, and um, I am also delighted to talk to you at this special point of time. I think that you are in front of a great opportunity because uh, it's a, a, a changing times. It is end of Moore's law and there's opportunity really for everyone, not just IT engineers, computer scientists, programmers, but also for engineers of all kinds. Uh, to give you some sense uh, of, of the impact that all other engineers and uh, other professions can make. In the Hewlett Packard Labs here, I'm working together with chemists who are developing the core technologies. I am working with physicists who are looking at photonic communication. Uh, my own manager is mechanical engineer who is contributing to design of the hardware and the computer systems, and I can go on and on. Uh, so, uh, if I were you, uh, I would really be delighted and I wish I were at your age at the start of career because the opportunity to impact the world is really tremendous. It doesn't happen um, every time because uh, the Moore's Law uh, ran for many decades and the same is true for other technologies such as DRAM. Uh, and uh, so this is the time after many decades when things are changing and uh, uh, if I were you, I, I would grab that uh, opportunity. So let me uh, start uh, the presentation. Can you all see it? Eddie, can you please confirm? Yes, uh, Dan, you are ready to go. Okay. So as um, Eddie pointed out, I'm a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard Labs. I'm also in running for the IEEE president 2021. Uh, my opponent is Kathy Land. Uh, and the, I will be presenting to you the work 
that is result of the efforts of many, many people from many organizations. Um, it started from Hewlett Packard Labs, but people from Penn State, Purdue, UIUC, University of Sao Paulo, Georgia Tech, ETH, Cambridge University. I couldn't fit um, all the organizations and all the names here. It is also the material that was presented in a number of both IEEE, ACM, and other conferences. Some of them are listed here, and some of the key papers are also listed. But let me start with motivation for this work. Um, it has really started with the amount of data that is being generated. And this amount has accelerated over um, the last few years. We have realized that in Hewlett Packard Labs and so have many other organizations that there's this exponential growth. And we started some of this work uh, back in um, uh, 2014 when it became obvious, but we are now in 2019 and predictions were that we are over 30 zettabytes and will grow uh, more and more. At the same time, the observation of the largest concern was that compute capabilities were flattening. That is, for many years, they were also exponentially growing, riding on the Moore's law, uh, which said that um, performance will double every 18 months. Uh, and that has been going on for many decades. But suddenly, uh, because of the laws of physics, because the these chips couldn't be made uh, any smaller anymore without interferences to the core uh, behavior, atoms and, and molecules, um, the performance started to flatten. The computer architects find many ways how to prevent that. Uh, and through creativity, they slowed it down. But effectively, as you can see on this picture, the signs were there for quite some time. And that reflects in the number of cores on a chip, especially in the uh, limitations on the power, frequency, performance of a single thread, and then obviously the number of transistors. And as we already pointed out, at the same time, demand for computation has been ex exercised by the tremendous data growth, because it's not just enough to have the data it is important to derive some conclusions from this data, some insights, and for that you need computation. To avoid this issue, these problems, um, people have started looking at how can they address it. And uh, my colleague, Tom Conti, as a part of the IEEE Rebooting Computing Initiative, which I'm also part of, uh, and his colleague uh, tried to look at different approaches how to avoid that. So the possibilities are to look at the device level, at the logic, functional units, at the microarchitecture, at instruction set architecture, at the overall architecture, at the APIs, languages, and algorithms. And as you try to go deeper in this stack, uh, the more, um, uh, the, the less uh, impact on overall uh, effort and the total disruption is smaller. So if you can, make the changes at the lower level, you can have, uh, you, you don't have to make a lot of impact. But as you go up in the stack, there are potentially some hidden changes that you can do. Uh, there are some architectural changes. And then eventually, if you transition completely to non von Neumann type of computing, you're really disrupting the whole uh, computation landscape. To give you some concrete examples of these changes, I will be giving you three uh, projects that I have been engaged with. The first one is memory-driven computing. And that one is, is really large. It entails about uh, probably a few hundred people inside of the labs and Hewlett Packard business units working on this. The next one is system software stack for dot product engine. That one has dozens of people collaborating both at universities, at Hewlett Packard labs, and then Hewlett Packard business units. And then very insular, small predictions for the future, how we can revisit computing in memory. So hopefully through these three examples, I can give you uh, some flavor of potential future going behind, uh, uh, going uh, beyond the uh, Moore's law. In, in other words, the future of computing. 
So let's start first with the memory-driven computing. For many decades, the computation was at the very high level organized as the picture on the left, where you had processing elements and associated memory. That's largely today's architecture. But with increased demand for memory and the generated data, memory becomes really the first level citizen. And everything revolves around memory. Once you store these zettabytes of data, um, perhaps probably not all at the same time, uh, and probably in some sort of non-volatile memory, then computation becomes the second uh, hand citizen and, and really revolves around uh, the memory. So conceptually, that is the big, the first big change that is taking place. The next big change, if you go a little bit deeper in this very high-level architecture, is the types of sharing of that data. There were primarily two types of sharing. One was using clusters, where there's shared nothing, where you have the network to which you connect the systems that communicate probably not through memory, but through message passing. And there's a number of these physical servers connected on the network. The other type is... Uh, the uh, shared everything, which is very high-end systems. And at Hewlett Packard Labs, we have such very large systems. We can go up to 64 terabytes of operating memory. And they are sharing everything. And there's some uh, coherent interconnect that supports coherency across this memory so that when different nodes try to write into this memory, it's being recognized by, by all others. What memory-driven computing brings to the table is shared something. It is really focused on non-volatile memory that is added to the uh, shared uh, nothing system so that this non-volatile memory is only shared across the nodes. Uh, and as you can see, it has the flavors of both shared nothing, simplicity of uh, interconnect and message passing, reliability thereof, and then simplicity of memory sharing, but only for non-volatile memory, which is probably uh, some order, one order of magnitude uh, slower than the access to the local uh, DRAM. So that is the, the next level of detail. So how are we benefiting from this memory-driven computing? How can application benefit? They can benefit from three aspects. First, memory is shared across the nodes. So you can communicate through memory. You can have unpartitioned data sets. You don't need to partition because anyone can access everything. Then memory is large. So you can do in-memory indexes. You can do pre-compute. You can memoize analysis. So you can start computation. You can bring it to some point and then reuse at later time because you don't have to drop these results. There's plenty of memory to store it. And finally, memory is persistent. There's no storage overheads, as it is the case with disks and more recently SSDs. There's no recalculations, and you can do fast checkpointing. So in uh, Hewlett Packard Labs, we introduced the world's largest single memory computer that consisted of 160 terabytes of memory, uh, dynamic memory. At that time, we didn't have developed non-volatile memory, so we have prototyped uh, with DRAM, uh, which was powered uh, for most of the time to mimic the non-volatile memory. Uh, we have been optimizing Linux-based operating system that was running on KVM flagship uh, dual socket capable ARM V8 processor, and we optimized workloads for that. And then we had photonic optical communication links uh, between these nodes. Finally, we have optimized the software programming tools to take advantage of this abundancy of large and persistent memory. So here is how that node, that prototype that we developed look like. So there is fabric uh, media controller here. There's fabric attached memory, as you can see pointed by these uh, red lines. There's local memory and compute system on a chip. And there's uh, at the end fabric bridge. How does it work in practice? So every node has the private memory system on a chip and then bridge. And when you access the local memory, you access it directly. 
but you can also directly access remote memory, except that there are different rules in terms of coherency, how you access that memory. Uh, because it is really hard to uh, support coherency for that large memory, it's not practically possible uh, for performance reasons, uh, we are achieving coherency at the higher levels of software. And that's where changes to the programming models take place. One such example that we took advantage of um, that is presented in the paper that appeared in ASPLOS three years ago is the uh, programming with multiple virtual address spaces. Typical operating system uh, has the abstraction of the process, which is the first class citizen, and it has associated uh, process virtual address space. However, with so much memory, there is no need anymore to limit ourselves for a single virtual address space. It was introduced at the times when there wasn't enough physical memory. So virtual address space was introduced to give perception of unlimited physical memory. And by paging in and out, it gave impression to the programmers and applications that you can access all of the memory when it's being shared or even more memory that it is physically possible in the system by paging out to disk. These assumptions were from many decades ago, and with the abundance of memory, we have now opportunity to work with multiple virtual address spaces, uh, which opens up other uh, before that unforeseen opportunities. For example, we have developed a new programming model, uh, which is different to the traditional client-server model, where uh, clients, uh, issue remote procedure calls into the server, execute something, and then get back results. With this new model, with multiple virtual address spaces, it is possible to have the threads actually migrate into virtual address space and then migrate out. As a matter of fact, you can have different protection domains, different reliability models, different consistency models, all kinds of different aspects of multiple virtual address spaces inside of a single process. That opens opportunity for versioning and checkpointing uh, and many other uh, things that people have not thought of before because the lack of hardware support wasn't there. The other example is managed data structures, which simplify programming on a persistent in-memory data. While there's a lot of memory and it is persistent, the processors haven't been taught by the companies that produce them to deal with non-volatile memory. So if you write to the non-volatile memory and the failure happens, that write might have been cached inside of processor because processor aren't aware that, I, that they are really writing in non-volatile memory. So what these managed data structures do is they help programmers uh, deal with these issues and when needed, they flush everything, but they don't do it all the time. So they enable you both easy ease of sharing and then high level concurrency controls. There's much more about this and this code is available in GitHub if you look up for it. Uh, and then the last, one of the last notions of uh, memory driven computing is that once you have all that memory, you may think that everything will run much quicker, but that was not the case. So we tried porting different applications, Spark, for example, for in-memory analytics. And we only got a fraction of performance improvement. Then we optimized and optimized and optimized. And we finally got only 15 times. Whereas the performance difference between uh, disks and non-volatile memory is about 40,000 times. So we weren't able to take advantage. Then we looked at a little bit newer types of algorithms and applications, we managed to achieve 40 times performance improvement. For large-scale graph inference, we managed to get 100 times faster improvement. And only once we took the new completely approaches, such as memoization, were we able to get to the order of magnitude, such as 10,000 times for the financial models. One distinct example is the company from Germany uh, for uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I think it's almost easier for me to say it in German than in English. Um, 
what we enable this company to do is not only to achieve 60 perform percent power reduction and cut research costs but also 100 times improve the performance now you may think that this is just a number but this 100 times really enable them to go from 22 minutes to 13 seconds for iteration of a research and when you think about it if you if it takes you 22 minutes to do something you'll go away then you'll come back later if it's 13 seconds you may as well wait and you are suddenly switching from batch processing to interactive processing that enabled them to dramatically improve the type of research they have been doing now let's switch to the next phase and that's dot product engine and i will try to speed up a little bit more to leave some time for the question so this is in my mind somewhere between the third and the fourth type of um, uh, potential approaches so my colleagues at Hewlett Packard Labs, who are chemists, by the way, came up uh, with the approaches to neuromorphic computing. They started with something that is called a memristor. And out of that, which was originally meant to be, and I'll talk in a couple of moments about that, originally meant to be non-volatile memory, in a very clever way, they turn it into a computation. They're trying to do something similar with optical. And the main message of this slide is really that the barriers and the, the thoughts how you can do computation are evolving. So suddenly you can think about doing computation using memory or using photonics. Uh, and so the, the opportunities are really tremendous for creative people. So here is uh, the type of Memorister. Memorister is a new device and the, the people have been giving uh, multiple day talks only on the theme of Memorister. But for all purposes, you can think of Memoristers as devices that can be organized as a crossbars here. And they can be programmed to either be zero or one. So once you program this crossbar, it is effectively a matrix. If you start bringing data as a vector to this matrix, and uh, if that um, vector is expressed in terms of voltages, uh, by doing by following Kirchhoff's law as the output, you will get the current that is uh, effectively the vector matrix multiplication. And that is the basis for this dot product engine. Uh, colleagues from uh, Hewlett Packard Labs have in 2016, using these crossbars, developed the architecture uh, of the whole dot product engine. So they start with the crossbar and because data, that is brought to crossbar is normally digital in the nature. There's a need for digital to analog conversion here. Then there's a need for sample and hold. Um, then uh, you uh, have these uh, intermediate results. Uh, and then eventually you do analog to digital computation. You take this unit, which is called in situ multiple accumulate, you put multiple of these and you get a tile along with some memory and some sigmoid functions. And then you put multiple tiles for a chip and then you can put multiple chips on the board. So that was uh, the first step, which was prelude to our work on the system software for dot product engine. We realized that it was really hard to program uh, this chip because uh, it was the pure hardware. So we came uh, the, uh, very smart uh, students from Purdue, Ayu Shankit and Izat El Hajj, who just presented uh, the paper on this topic at ASPLOS 2019 last week, they came up with the idea, why don't we add instruction set architecture to it and then come up with a compiler so that we can much more easily program uh, uh, this, this hardware. And then, so they've uh, added control unit, instruction memory, decode here, some core memory, memory execution unit, vector function unit, and scalar function unit. And so this is the new core. And then you can add multiple cores um, with some FIFO buffers and memory, and that comprises the tile. So this was the upgrade from the previous architecture. Then you can take multiple tiles and put them in a node, and then multiple nodes on the board. Uh, for this type of architecture, um, it was needed to develop a software stack. So we have developed various pieces to this stack. 
First, we have developed Onyx Interpreter. Onyx stands for Open Neural Network Exchange. And it enables you that for this hardware, with the plugin for Onyx, you can work with any other uh, machine deep learning platform, such as TensorFlow, CNTK, Cafe2, uh, and other um, platforms. And, and you only need to develop uh, the plugins for the Onyx interpreter. And then assumption is that these platforms also have plugins that convert to this uh, uh, in, in interchangeable format. The next thing in the software stack, we developed application optimization layer because a lot of uh, neural networks are very application specific. It is possible to do optimizations such as quantization and many others. The next layer in the stack is compiler and assembler. And I'll go in a little bit more detail in the later slide. And then uh, there's a driver that uh, takes the output from these models and the data that is coming in and writes into the different uh, hardware. It could be our DPE or it could be FPGAs, different ASICs, et cetera. We also developed a number of tools. We have about three, four different emulators. Some are architectural, some are um, cycle accurate, others are uh, purely for power, et cetera. Uh, and we also developed the CAMU, which is um, more targeted towards develop uh, users. Uh, that was uh, an effort of about, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of dozen people who work very closely with the hardware developers. We have also established the different workflows. So we have the research line, the research thread that uh, has been developing, uh, researching first inference, then training, and now optimizations. And then we have a little bit later following advanced developer that takes outputs of research thread and transfer them uh, to more uh, product um, optimal level, uh, optimal stage of, of the uh, development. So I promised to you to talk a little bit about uh, uh, compiler. So the past student, past intern who also contributed uh, to the space jump uh, multiple virtual address spaces, who is now a professor at the uh, American uh, University of Beirut, uh, has single-handedly developed compiler for this, which was again then taken and uh, improved by the software developers in Hewlett Packard. But the compiler consists of multiple phases. First, building task graph, then mapping uh, dot products to crossbars out of these graphs, then mapping non-dot products to tiles, then virtual to physical tile assignment, and finally code generation. So there are some aspects that are typical for uh, any compiler, and then there are some aspects that are very specific to the dot product engine. So in summary, um, due to the end of Moore's law and uh, Dennard scaling, there was a need for these new technologies, and this dot product engine is one such approach. Uh, it is uh, original architecture, which was specialized and optimized originally for CNNs. But by adding this um, uh, instruction set architecture and compiler, we were able to expand it to many other uh, neural networks. By doing this, we improve programmability and management. Uh, we allowed use of multiple DL platforms through Onyx and neural networks. And then finally, uh, we can accomplish sharing and multiplexing across multiple users and applications by carefully uh, working at the lowest level. Uh, what I didn't mention is there's also firmware on these chips that take care of pipelining and other aspects. So I come to the third uh, and last part of this talk, uh, which is the most speculative ones. Uh, it is um, It has been presented as the IEEE ICDCS invited uh, paper at the Vision Track uh, in, in uh, Vienna, Austria last year. And it is work uh, of, of my own together with a number of uh, distinguished colleagues at Hewlett Packard Labs. So I consider this um, computing in memory very close to non von Neumann computing, if not there. Um, so, um, for Neumann, architecture was there since 1945, and uh, it was dominated um, by this simple architecture. There is a central processing unit, which consists of 
control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, memory unit, and then input device and output device. This very simple model uh, managed to remain for how many years? Uh, almost 70 years, more than 70 years. Uh, but unfortunately, over the time, for all these reason that I'm, reasons that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, the memory access latency started to become a problem. Uh, and CPU um, uh, and, and CPUs became faster than memory. So memory suddenly became the bottleneck. Also, cache hierarchies, uh, even though bringing major benefits in the past, uh, also introduced problems in terms of uh, coherence complexity and most recently security flaws. So there are many alternatives, such as uh, processing in memory, which have been considered also for multiple decades, but never took on. So here is this aspect and challenges. If you look at the bytes per flops over the decades, uh, uh, this has dramatically dropped down. So there's this steady reduction of uh, compute systems ability to effectively operate on large data. Uh, at the same time, there was increased data volumes and data mining applications with limited compute intensity. So there was a very strong interest to find new ways to reverse this historical trend. And one way of doing it was meant to be uh, processing in memory. And, and that's also related to what we call uh, memory-driven computing. But it hasn't been taken to the level that we would like to take it. So there was a lot of past work. So uh, Peter Kogge was one who was well-known in 90s. David Patterson spoke about it. Uh, Josep Torellas. Uh, then there was the phase of memory side accelerators, which tried to uh, close to the memory attempt some um, close to the memory again uh, uh, acceleration such as um, uh, um, there, there's a number of uh, attempts to do uh, either encryption decryption or compression decryption uh, decryption etc and then most recently there's a the use of memory stores uh, such as work of Yavitz, Ni and Ja they all look at, at these approaches but they are still at the academic level. So if many failed, why do we think computing in memory can be successful? Well, first of all, um, all these uh, earlier attempts, in my mind, were ahead of their time. Uh, and it's all about the timing. Uh, and I think we are at this perfect storm that I tried to emphasize in, in previous parts of the talk. There are now emerging technologies, neuromorphic, bio-inspired, and many others that are all trying to revisit von Neumann models. Uh, but also to address problems with caches, security, complexity, etc. At the same time, there is application demand, image, video, audio recognition. You see all terrorist attacks that uh, drive the need uh, for doing uh, increased security uh, through uh, video recognition and other aspects. Then there is economy of scale. Processing in memory at that time lacked the economy of scale to develop something. Now the phones. Uh, are developed in so huge numbers that video recognition on them is affordable. And finally, it's critical to mankind, as I already hinted. So these new deep learning applications are being deployed in every facet of life. Sensors, autonomous vehicles, I don't know, at your place, but in US at times at three corners uh, of the street, I'm seeing the uh, vehicles that are trying to record the traffic so that they can enable uh, uh, self-driving cars. So we are increasingly dependent on, I, on, I, on IT and cybersecurity. And there's a number of use cases. Edge computing is one uh, where you need to do acceleration and uh, AI close to the edge rather than moving all that data to the cloud. Then memory-centric computing, I gave you a number of examples of that, those. And then deep learning. Um, and finally, uh, these use cases have the following characteristics in common. Data, is, data needs to be close to computation to avoid transferring it. Some data is persistent, so non-volatile memory will be very useful. And finally, these applications employ data workflow. Uh, so uh, there's a need for data manipulation, understanding, mining, et cetera. So some of these phases are optimized for data transformation. Uh, or, or filtering, others are embarrassingly parallel computing, etc. So how can we evolve this traditional von Neumann architecture? Well, 
a colleague of mine, my past manager and past um, senior fellow at Hewlett Packard Lab, Stan Williams, came up with a conclusion that memristive switches can enable stateful logic. Uh, which can execute material implication. And based on that, he came to the conclusion that by programming non-volatile memory, you can not only store the state, but you can uh, program the execution. Based on that, you can think of that these control units and arithmetic logic units need not be uh, static. They can be reprogrammed on the fly as well. And that um, enhanced by the way of persistent memory can lead us to the new type of von Neumann architecture. So basically, if you can have this processing and persistent memory and interconnects that are both programmable, you can come up with a new type, new architecture uh, that will succeed the von Neumann architecture. And I think that it will result in something like this. So using interconnects and processing and persistent uh, memory, uh, you can, by programming it, you can come up with a completely new architecture. Um, it effectively, uh, technologically, and architecturally collocates processing and memory for both compute and control functions. Uh, interconnects are integral, and uh, programming and configuration becomes core functionality. That's why they are featured at the center. Uh, because they reconfigure paths for this data uh, flow model. And there are a number of interconnect standards, such as CCIX, Gen Z, OpenCAPI, that are prime candidate for success in this domain. So how do I see that evolving? So at the basis, there is this physical memory store matrix. Out of that, you can generate logic elements matrix, which is programmable. And out of that, you can build um, these uh, computation in memory micro units, which are each programmable in their own right. To effectively um, use this, you can have this workflow. So you, have, uh, you can have the flow of data all the way to the right, but you can develop routing in and out matrix. You can also develop programs on the fly and deploy them, but you can go even one step further and develop whole ISA expressed as a matrix. So now if you think as the data flowing into your hardware architecture, you can achieve very fine grain reconfiguration because not only the data can come in, but the information about routing, information about programs that is deployed as the data flows and even the whole uh, infra instruction set architecture. So you would have this micro unit uh, out of which you can build SIM unit. And then, as I said, you can have these packets that can carry routing, data, code, and I say. And then you can build multiple tiles out of this, and out of tiles you can build nodes, et cetera. So uh, what are the approaches to programming this SIM? I hinted by what can go in. But you can think in traditional static data flow where you just push the data through it. You can do dynamic data flow where uh, parts of it can be very dynamic, be it um, uh, the paths or even the execution. Or you can take it all the way to the boundaries of imagination where you can have self-programmable data workflow, which enables carrying code, which was the attempt for many years. But as I said, uh, it might have been not the right time for this. Some important aspects that apply to this, these new architectures, of which this might be one example, are always security, virtualization, and resource management. And the impact on these aspects is that security can benefit from packet-based communication because packet-based communication has achieved uh, high-level security standards, as well as from data flow architecture. In terms of virtualization and partitioning, we can have dynamic hardware isolation, we can introduce quality of service, and even fail over by introducing redundancy in the offering parts of these SIM elements that are not used uh, uh, typically, but introduced only when other parts fail. And finally, in terms of resource management, we'll have traditionally load information management, load balancing, and then closed loops to enable 
uh, uh, SLA agreements and, and self-balancing. There are also non-functional characteristics such as fall detection, uh, containment, prevention, fall recovery. I already spoke a little bit about that. Scaling, I think based on the past experience of uh, uh, packet-based communication, I think uh, we have a lot of opportunities there in terms of configurability. We're now talking about very fine grain reconfigurable architecture. And finally, in terms of support and serviceability, uh, we can do a lot of self-healing, closed loop and preventive support. In terms of performance, we came up with some other uh, measures in DP that are directly applicable. And we found, which is very, very preliminary, that uh, we can achieve, uh, especially in terms of power, much better uh, savings than existing hardware architectures. And then in terms of bandwidth, uh, which is really important for data flow, also high, and then a little bit less in terms of latency. Uh, I think this picture is, in, for myself at least, intriguing how we compare uh, parallel shared memory systems, distributed, and then in memory. What are the programming models? We have multi-threaded, message passing, and then data flow. In terms of scaling, we have hundreds of cores versus 200s or hundreds of recs. And then there's no perceived limit higher than exascale in terms of in-memory. In terms of fault tolerance, we have whole partition failing in terms of shared memory because you can't predict uh, or can't find which thread failed that easily. For distributed, we have improved failover because we can fail over to another machine. And then for in-memory, we have the stream redirection to redundant units. Uh, it also helps with security as well as for robustness. But you can ask me, what type of applications is this in-memory really suited for? We've done this uh, very high level uh, matrix, which attempted to give some indications what type of, uh, what classes of applications is computing in memory useful? And you can see that it's really useful for machine learning, neural networks, graph problems, whereas it's not really useful for Bayesian inference, Markov chain. It's also not useful for uh, search, which is indexing problem, optimization problems, scientific computing, collaborative and signal image processing. And then it is so and so useful for Markov chain, for databases, uh, especially uh, for uh, transactions, and then for finite element modeling. You can also look up vertically for what types of uh, characteristics it is useful. It's definitely not useful for, for compute and communication intensive and iterative models, but it is useful for data intensive, operational intensive, uh, and for high parallelism, where there's dependencies. So this is the high level uh, classification. There's a lot of related work, um, even most recently. It goes way beyond what I just listed here. So you can look at our IEEE ICDCS paper to get the details. Uh, and I came to the end of my talk. I would like really to give you opportunity to ask the questions. Uh, we have motivated the need uh, for these uh, new computed architecture in this talk, especially uh, with computing in memory at the end by the end of Moore's law and the accelerated generation of the data. We presented the SIM model in more detail as well as DP. We discussed security and other non-functional characteristics. Uh, and in general, both um, memory-driven computing and computer in memory is already being demonstrated in research, and it is adopted in certain product uh, prototypes. But there are, in my mind, uh, most important aspects that need further in-depth exploration. So it's not a given that uh, any of these will uh, be adopted as widely uh, used um, hardware architectures and, and software stacks. First of all, we need to exploit inherent application parallelism. Without that, uh, no hardware architecture will be successful. With security, we have failed uh, really miserably over the years where new flaws were over and over uh, uh, found. And finally, software development productivity is really important and probably the crucial. If the, if the people cannot develop uh, effectively new applications, no matter how effective hardware is, so software development is really critical. So with this, um, I came to the end of the talk. I served approximately, saved approximately 15 minutes for questions. 
uh, and I thank you very much for your attention. So Dan, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting presentation. I have to say, a lot of the concepts are beyond my knowledge as well, and perhaps most of the students as well, but certainly opened my eyes up to uh, the possibilities and sort of where we're going with computing, some of the challenges that uh, engineers and scientists face in overcoming uh, you know, these, these uh, limitations to computing. So very interesting. We do have a few questions here that I've noted for you. I think we have five or six questions. So the first question came from Ogyan Stefanovic. He said, there's been a lot of hype about this in the last few weeks. Uh, so is it realistically possible to use DNA-like long-term non-volatile storage? And if so, when? Yeah. Well, um, so Ogyan, um, I've been doing predictions for the last five years. And uh, the only constant in all these predictions is that we continuously... Uh, failed. Uh, we were correct in certain aspects, but in many others we have. I have seen the first talk on um, using DNA as the uh, for both memory and and more recently even for computation. Some people are talking, but primarily as a memory. I think it was Asplos a couple of years ago. I think Louis says they gave that talk. Uh, he's from University of Washington. I think that. Um, if I may, we have been trying to use uh, analogy for from uh, human uh, for many things, including computation with synapses, etc. I think that we need to understand how our body works, and DNA is is one special example where um, it is really used to uh, transfer to the the memory of of, of our being to our uh, uh, ancestors and and uh, uh, and so that we carry on characteristics. I think that there's opportunity whether um, DNA will be itself used for that or the model of DNA will be used and we've been uh, having a reading class here in, in, in labs. I think yesterday we, we had that class and we discussed exactly how we can leverage DNA sequencing and, and, and other things. But uh, I think it's really hard to predict. This one is uh, far out. Um, I can credibly say that I don't believe that anything will be done in five years. Uh, it's more likely in even 10 years. Um, I mean, people are even talking, for example, about quantum computing. Um, and I, I spoke to some customers and they were asking me, when do you believe that will happen? And, and they're trying to convince me that it will happen in 20 years. I think anything that is out more than three to five years you know, it can be anything. So uh, my answer is, I believe that we can learn a lot from DNAs, um, perhaps not use it directly. One day, uh, either uh, DNA is fired or even DNA uh, will be used for something, but I don't think anything will, will happen before five or 10 or even many more years out. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dan. We have the next question from Damir Bayramovic. He says, will these hardware changes allow us to train neural networks faster with and with less data? Will it help to make computers learn more similar to the way humans learn? Yeah. So um, I think we are exactly at that phase of research in labs. Uh, to, to give you some uh, broader context with this DP, system software for DP, we started with inference, which is brute force, where we put all the um, all the, the neural network layers and then we try to uh, execute. Then we move to the training, which was the next phase, which is more, more complex, requires more hardware changes and, and different uh, phases um, in terms of backpropagation, adjustments, etc. And now we're looking at optimizations. So there's a number of potential optimizations because at every layer, you don't use the same amount uh, of, of the tiles, uh, nor do you need the same precision. And in certain cases, sensitivity to error is much lower than in other layers. We do that intuitively as humans, if you were hinted at that. So we know if, you, if we look at the watch, we know exactly it's watch. So, uh, But simply looking at it, you don't need to analyze the whole watch in order to, we, what would normal um, neural network do to analyze 
all the aspects of the watch, the, the, the image, the colors, everything to recognize. We just look at it and we know because we have memoized uh, in our um, brain somewhere how does the watch look like. And that's exactly also the technique of memoization. So I think um, it's a really confluence of many aspects. It's not just taking neural networks and how you do it on GPUs or TPUs or even processors or our DP or whatever other hardware architecture. It is really a confluence of, uh, of the amount of memory where you can store intermediate results uh, during the training, the whole end-to-end -end architecture. Because when you do, you specifically ask for training. Uh, today, you can't do training at, uh, at the edge because there's no power, there's no uh, en energy, uh, there's no computation power, no memory. So what you typically do and, and what these self-driving cars do, they, they uh, record everything using video, cameras, lidars, and other stuff. And they store uh, many petabytes of data in their car. Then they take these disks, SSDs, put it in, in their high-end servers, which do training, and then they go back, et cetera. Now, you can accelerate that <coughs> by having distributed architecture where you put some of the models which are being trained uh, at the edge and then uh, extract uh, using some network, limited amount of data, pull it back to cloud and do additional training there. You can also do peer-to-peer -peer among multiple edge devices. So there are many ways how you can optimize conceptually, hardware-wise, by utilize, utilizing techniques such as memoization, and then also by uh, leveraging optimization that are possible at every neural network. I hope, Damir, this at least partially answer your question. And by the way, both Damir and Ogyan, if I haven't answered your question uh, sufficiently, please email me, and that applies to others as well who may not have a chance to get que uh, questions answered. I'm just conscious of time, so I'm going to skip a couple of questions and move on to the next one from Zorana Staka. We have, how will these changes more and more, architectural changes, non-van human computing, affect the price of computers? Well, uh, affect price of computers. Is that what, what you asked? Yes, price. that's correct. The so, price. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'm a researcher. Um, I happen to be on and off manager. So, uh, But even as a researcher, as a distinguished technologist, I'm responsible to think of business. But I certainly cannot uh, predict uh, all the economic models. Now... What I can tell you that the prices have been going down, as, as you have seen, of the components. Now, the prices of solutions um, are uh, independent, potentially, of this. So there's the cost of developing this hardware and software, and then there's the price, which uh, depends on many other factors. Um, what I think, and let me, let me use another paradigm to try to answer your question. So I, I'll digress a little bit, but I'll come back. So please uh, uh, stay with me. When memories were starting to drop in price in United States, development of memory, production of memory started dropping in price heavily in United States a couple of decades ago, and uh, production moved to uh, Taiwan. Uh, there was a concern uh, about economy here because the memory dropped down dramatically. At the same time, the United States started introducing uh, new processors, which uh, took off in terms of uh, profitability. So they, from the uh, producer's perspective, they managed to, to make up. Uh, also, uh, over the decades, you have noticed that both Intel and Microsoft were able to maintain relatively high price by always introducing the new versions uh, the new releases of processors, which were just enough more powerful uh, or and or the new versions of Microsoft operating systems and new applications, which were just enough powerful to justify the price increases. So um, I think that the determining factor, which was really the end uh, bullet of my whole talk was development. So the human uh, participation in the development will largely determine the price because it, it is the most costly. If you introduce humans who have to develop something, it will cost much more than you can automate the whole process. That's the reason if you go to Samsung while their factories, which are really the towns, 
inside are completely automated to eliminate the cost of humans. So I'm not sure that I have given direct answer to any of you three, but I gave you different perspectives. I think that this new type of computing to give direct and straightforward answer will reduce the cost of individual elements, but the overall solution will probably continue to develop on contractor costs. Um, what is more important, I think, it will help the quality of life, which is not what you ask. But I think uh, we all, as, as uh, conscious of the mankind and uh, human aspects, we, sh we should care about that most. Yeah, then I'm going to go to our next question. It's from Zvonimira Jakic. Uh, the question is, is it profitable to reprogram and rebuild new computer architecture in terms to have more secure systems and data when every day we can see that data and memory is easy to share? Well, it, it all depends. If you remember my um, four-stage um, model where you can ship the data, you can ship the routing, you can ship the code, you can ship the, the instruction. I think it all depends. I'll give you example where it makes sense, and I'll give you example where it doesn't make sense. So um, I, we, we know, and it's public information, that um, Microsoft deployed in their data centers FPGAs. So they reprogrammed them um, whenever they discover uh, new benefits, new performance improvements, and they are still evolving because they have uh, their Azure cloud is really running all types of applications. So for them, it makes sense to more frequently update these FPGAs, these accelerators, which are effectively what you're talking about. They may not be ISA altogether all the way out, but they are um, executing new code and they're not any more fixed um, accelerators like uh, TPUs, for example. On the other hand, uh, TPUs, um, tensor processing, TensorFlow processing unit from Google, which are executing primarily uh, the code for search, also some other applications, but not as much as Azure Cloud. They're optimized really for search and some other small number of classes. So for them, it makes sense to develop them as ASICs. So uh, what I'm trying to say is um, it is not profitable to make uh, huge changes to everything, but it all depends on your use case. Um, at the same time, you are seeing that uh, processor vendors are increasingly more uh, developing new types of chips. Uh, you have even open source chips, RISC-V, which is completely open source. So it's very easy to uh, do the changes. And if it's behind the scenes, it doesn't matter. But to give you a very specific answer to you, if the change is hidden, if it's, for example, some accelerator, behind the well-known APIs that aren't changing, then it, it, it is easy to change. It's not costly. It makes financial differences. If you are impacting the whole stack, then, then you, you're not going to do it that frequently. But if you cannot evolve your architecture anymore because of von Neumann's uh, limitations and post uh, Moore's law, if you don't have any options, you're going to do it. Uh, anyways, because you need to come up with uh, with the, with the new accelerators. I, I hope again that answers uh, at least some aspects of your question. Yeah, then we've got two more questions and see if we can get through these pretty quickly. We go back to uh, Damir Bayramovic who had a second question, and the question was: Is synchronization of the system done on software level in this kind of approach? Uh, so if you're talking about memory-driven computing, that was uh, one approach we have taken. So typical hardware coherency um, wasn't possible because of the scale. We introduced some hardware support, but it was largely software aware. It had to be. Okay, thank you, Dan. We have one last question, and I'm just pulling it up in front of me right now. And it also comes from Zoran Ashtaka. And it's actually referring to quantum entanglement. So you mentioned that you work with physicists. Can we find a good use case for computing? Um, so I am assuming that you're asking whether quantum entanglement could be used for computation. Uh, and I'll, I'll go with that assumption. Um, I think that... Um, Quantum is an interesting approach, and 
it is really extremely um, focused research in the United States. I've seen a lot of uh, I've seen a lot of um, scientists who are looking at it. Personally, I think quantum will eventually result in in some outcomes. I don't know whether quantum entanglement can be generalized to computation because of many limitations, such as cooling that that is at this moment uh, financially not sustainable at the scaling because with the current understanding it's not possible to scale because i don't know many how many thousand qubits etc but there's a lot of uh, money and funding that is being thrown at quantum so i'm i'm confident that some outcomes will come out uh, i believe there's a lot of opportunity for security for some focused niche um uh, niche results will come out and which could be very impactful. Whether it will um, be successful in, in in general computation, I think it's way too early. I'm uh, cautiously pessimistic there. Yeah, and with that, I think we've exhausted all of our questions. We've also just gone over the hour. Uh, I want to just thank you very much again on behalf of the 50-odd young people that were online listening to this uh, webinar series. Thank you very much for being our first speaker and taking time out of your busy schedule to actually enlighten us on some of the amazing research that's going on at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, perhaps for the end, maybe just a bit of advice for young people who are perhaps looking to go down this path, um, something that should really pay close attention to what should they really um, think about when they're moving into this direction. So I'll give you a couple of advices. And um, the first one is uh, don't take anything for granted, including everything I told you. Uh, you need to be passionate in your belief. So if uh, a lady Shtaka believes that quantum entanglement is the right approach, she's passionate about it, just go uh, ignore um, my advice. Go and, and look at it because the brave people uh, found new lands. Uh, that's one advice. The other advice I can give you is that every extra mile I traveled always paid off. Uh, I can give you offline a number of examples, but whenever I was in the position to do something or not do something, which required some effort on my behalf, and I did it, it always paid off. Perhaps not immediately, perhaps not in obvious way, but you know, um, don't don't give up on on efforts. Efforts are really important. So with that being said, Dan, I can see a lot of people greeting you here, saying you that was very informative, very inspiring. Thank you very much. I think you've uh, won the hearts of probably 50-odd students from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, my hope is that one, one day we will see at least one of these uh, youth come over to Palo Alto and undertake an internship or perhaps even get a full-time job working uh, alongside you and many of the great uh, people that the former Yugoslavia has produced and they're doing incredible things all over the world. So again, thank you very much on behalf of all of the students who can't speak to you. And Dan has asked me to tell you all of you guys that please connect with him. He's more than happy to share more information with you. Add him on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to stay in touch with him. And uh, thank you very much everyone for tuning in and listening on to our first webinar series next month. In the middle of the month, we'll be launching our second presentation. And everyone else, enjoy your evening. Dan, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you very much again. Thanks for having me. Bye.